Welcome everybody to another thrilling episode of HomeKit Insider. You have me, Andrew O'Hara, here with my pal, and as far as I know, the only podcast host who survives purely on a Tutti Fruity, Tootsie Roll based diet, Stephen Robles. How you doing, man? Tutti Fruity on a looty. Oh boy. I didn't get up there. Sorry. I was trying to do the... Who is that? <laughs> That's uh, Is that James Brown? Yeah. Tutti Fruity. <laughs> I'm Sorry. still just in awe at what just happened. Yeah, you know, it was just so much. My kids got. You know, I appreciate got that you go with the uh, the flavored tootsie rolls. Like it gives you like a variety mm. of fruits to put into that's your right. diet, rather than just that's the right. chocolate ones. Like that's unhealthy. Like you're going with the fruit no, no, ones. No, no, no. I, yeah, I get fruit, you. I think it's good. Yeah, it's you're basically eating an apple or a kiwi it's or whatever. It's pretty whatever much the same right. thing. Yeah, it's exactly. literally the same thing. There's no absolutely. Difference. My kids uh, yeah. did go through a phase of playing the Tutti Fruity song on HomePods on repeat uh, for a while. It's a fun song. Nice. It's a fun song. Anyway. Okay. Not, that's um, well, maybe, I don't know if you've ever seen that John Mulaney uh, stand-up bit where he just played uh, <laughs> uh, What's New know. Pussycat on the diner. <laughs> <laughs> and he just I've kept playing that. it on repeat. Oh. And like he like loves the fact that it like goes really quiet. And then it's like, what? What? And then Pussycat. And it just goes into it again. So everyone thinks Scares it stops. Everybody. And then it just yes. goes again. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Just go look it up. That's, that's funny. Okay. Yeah. John Mulaney. Very good. Uh, we have one five star review, by the way, this past week. You can keep those coming in. Thank you. This was N.W. Hild from Great Britain. Listen, he probably knows William Gallagher. Andrew, let me ask you this. Did you know William Gallagher has like a robust Wikipedia page where he's basically famous over there? Did you know about this? Wow. That's yeah, impressive. I know about this. It's it's one of my life goals to have a Wikipedia page, but but that's okay. I don't have it, I don't have it yet. Maybe one day. Uh, anyway, uh, so thank you for that five star reviews. We have some follow up. I want to do two quick follow up things. Number one, you talked about uh, your HomeKit smart plug coffee maker apparatus uh, to auto brew your your home stuff in the, your coffee in the morning, and then we had a listener, Michael from Illinois, send us a DM, and he has one of these. Smarter coffee makers. Smarter is actually the brand. Smarter. It is not HomeKit, but it does work with Siri shortcuts, meaning you could automate it in like a scenes and stuff. And so just want to put this in there. It's Wi Fi, voice activated. It looks like it has a really nice app. But this is the Smarter Coffee Maker. It's 199 euros, which I assume is 18,000 US dollars. I'm not really sure how that uh, conversion works right now. One ninety nine pounds, maybe. I don't know what that is. You, is it your? I don't know what it is. It's one ninety nine uh, over there. But yeah, really cool. So there's a coffee maker out there that actually integrates with shortcuts. It can actually grind beans. You can put whole beans in the top. Very nice. We'll put a link in show notes. But uh, just want to point that out. That's a cool follow up. Thank you, Michael. Looks good. Yeah. So I actually I tested one of these about. Oh. I want to say four years ago. Um, oh. So it's been a long time. It was not a, a recent test. And they had sent one over to review. And as is the case, like, with review products sometimes, like, they're not new, right? You're getting, like, a press unit that kind of gets that gets shuffled around a little bit. And it showed up, and it straight up wouldn't connect to my Wi-Fi. So I never got mm. to fully test this thing out. Um, mm. Yeah, it was a nice-looking okay. coffee maker and everything. But they were they were supposed to be sending over a replacement unit, and they had stock issues, and it mm. never showed up. But it looked nice, and I, I'm yep. glad I've heard of this before. And I did not know they had added Siri shortcut support to it. So that is a really good addition. They make some neat stuff. They also make this fridge camera, so you can see what's going on like in your fridge. <laughs> like if you ever wanted to see your eggs <laughs> dancing with each other when the fridge is closed and the lights go off, this camera can let you do that. Wow! Wow! Yeah. I didn't know eggs did that. I need a camera in my fridge. Oh, yeah. They do the whole thing. They actually use the butter to make like a like a skating rink, and then they like Whoa. dance around. It's impressive. It's like, yeah. I don't know how they get skates on with no legs or feet. That's mm. interesting. Yeah, I that's know. That's wild. Uh, but anyway, yeah, very cool. Okay. <laughs> so appreciate that. And also one of the follow-up, this was cool. Uh, Twitter user YSR50, we had talked about the rechargeable adapter for the old-school Magic Mouse. You actually – Needed to use a magic mouse that took AA batteries for this thing to work. But it was this contraption you put in the mouse that replaces AA batteries, and it becomes wirelessly chargeable on this little pad that you can then get. I'll put a link to, like, some old review of this. This came out in, like, 2010, 12 years ago. But 
uh, user YSR50 still uses this thing every day. He sent us a picture on Twitter of this mouse charging on this wireless pad. Honestly, it's pretty cool. I kind of wish that this was an option right now. I wish there was Qi Charge. Like, this is it's ideal. I had to charge my Magic Mouse yesterday. I tweeted about it because that's what you do when you when you have to charge your Magic Mouse. you got to turn it upside down, and it looks like a turtle that's on its back. I mean, this is so. This is much better. This was twelve years ago. <laughs> why, why can't we do this I know. now? Because even even when Apple came out, of those they introduced their own versions of like rechargeable batteries. If you remember, right. which were just yeah, they were just custom branded Anna Loops, I believe. Like which like the number one rechargeable batteries you can just buy on Amazon. But they right. had like their own. I still have it. A little wall charger for them. Yeah, and yeah, that was the only way to get a rechargeable Magic Mouse. And then V two came out, and the only thing that they changed was swapping from USB or uh, AA batteries to rechargeable. But this thing, it replaced the batteries and the door. And then you just pop onto the bottom, boom, wirelessly rechargeable mouse. It's pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. But now now we got the turtle mouse, lightning port on the bottom. (laughs) Showing, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, showing my my black magic mouse, the lightning port right there. But anyway, yeah, so there's that. Uh, okay, so we actually have HomeKit news, two-ish things, two-ish things. Akara, HomeKit brand we talked about very often, they're actually working on a curtain driver that is HomeKit compatible. Now, curtain drivers, we had talked about these SwitchBot curtain things before, where it's literally this robot that hangs on your curtain rod, and it will it has little, like, wheels that it will literally roll across the bar and push your curtain closed or pull it open Either way, and you can basically automate your curtains that way. SwitchBot is not HomeKit compatible yet. They work with Siri shortcuts, but not HomeKit. This one from Akara would be HomeKit compatible, but they're doing crowdfunding right now. It's not available to purchase. There's no release date yet, but it looks like it could be coming soon, and this will then, well, I think, only be the second curtain-pushing robot uh, like this that we have seen. And honestly, I have to say, I've been watching a lot of YouTube desk setup videos and like office setups because i'm gearing up you know to do my home office i actually saw somebody with the switchbot ones and it was pretty cool somehow they got it to work perfectly like it it smoothly opened the curtain smoothly closed they were able to hide it back i was never able to get it to work that good but anyway the car might be coming out with a home kit one so that's cool although i'm curious andrew home kit does not have a category for these kinds of things right i mean it's there's no curtain opener I would count. I mean, I don't know how these show up. Um, yeah. But I would I would count them the same as as shades, like whether you got honeycomb rollers or anything like that, because they're effectively mm. the same thing, right? How much percent open are they? Mm. That's true. Might be um, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or it might just be like maybe an there's like thing. there's like three icons. Maybe someone was complaining on Twitter like it's been like ten years of HomeKit and we still have like five icons for lights or something. Like that Uh, something basic that Apple still hasn't added into the home app. So, yeah, maybe there's like two icons that you can use for curtains, vertical ones and rollers. Maybe. I I will say, uh, this is a side note. I'm going to bring this back up later, maybe when I get a house update. But I'm going to ask you about naming your home devices. I know we've talked about this before, but I'm getting ready to name like 50 different light switches. And so I'm very curious your strategy again. And we need to remind me. So I'll ask you about that. Okay. Just, Just putting it in your head now, incepting it. Boom, it's in your head. Okay. All right, uh, one other news. This is another unfortunate piece of news. Insteon, which was one of the very first HomeKit brands, Insteon basically disappeared recently. Their servers went down. The app has been unresponsive. Their like support forums and social media pages are totally unresponsive. Mysteriously, the Insteon CEO, Rob Lilness, like scrubbed all mentions of Insteon from his LinkedIn page, like, my goodness, like this is some kind of like lumen uh, severance thing. Like everyone is just like disappearing. And unfortunately, if you tried to access the Insteon devices in the app, if you still had them, you couldn't use them in the app. But again, this is why we always say HomeKit. When you have devices that work with HomeKit, even if a company disappears like Insteon just did, you could still use their devices. But I don't know, man, what do you think about this whole Insteon thing? I mean... Go figure. Insteon's been around a while, and I I love yeah. that. <laughs> what Jake or something was like bugging us like uh, two months ago. Have you heard anything new from Insteon? Like they used to be a big HomeKit company, and then he like went back and liked his tweet, so it showed up in my timeline again. And I was like, oh, dude, I guess 
because yeah. there's nothing new coming from them right now. But my favorite part mm-hmm. is the fact that that what Rob Lyleness or whatever just scrubbed it from his profile. Yeah. Like J.K. didn't didn't work there. Yeah, like yeah. he's going to leave a really big gap on his resume going into the next position. Just what were you doing for the last like six years? No, nothing really. Yeah. At least, what was the other brand that just went defunct? I don't want to get it wrong. Is iHome. It, is it iHome? Yeah, it was iHome. Which, again, Which at least... Brand, they, brand is still around. They just shut down right. their smart home servers. Right, but at least they did it right. You know, they emailed all their customers. They made a statement. They said, hey, you know, what? what is that? What do you mean? Like, a little bit right? I mean... They announced it with an update in their app. Like, you launch the app, and they're like, <laughs> BT Dubs, That's server true. going bye-bye. And, like, that was it. And only after, and then press starts reaching out. So they're kind of like, what's going yeah. on? And they're like, oh, yeah, we're officially shutting those down starting, like, April 2nd. Yeah. So. That's kind of that, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that was, like, the best way of doing it. No. But, yes, at least they gave notice instead of just ghosting them and trying to just, you know, pretend nothing ever happened and they never existed and just disappearing. Yeah. Yeah, that is better. So, anyway, farewell to another HomeKit brand. And, uh, you know, hopefully more brands will enter the HomeKit space and with Matter, colon, I'll believe it when I see it, which we're going to talk about in a second. So that's my official tagline. I'm contractually obligated to ta- give that tagline every time I mention <laughs> it. Uh, but before we get into that, because you actually had a, a special conversation uh, with some, some people over there, we do want to mention we have a friend that sponsored the show this week, Dio Connect. We had mentioned them before. I'm so excited for this speaker. This is an AirPlay 2 speaker that is launching now. They have reached their funding, and so they're going to be shipping soon. But we want to tell you to get in there and support it. The sale, they're having a sale on their speakers during this pre-order time where you can save, I think it's about 17%, 17% off. And it's the really first ever under $99 AirPlay 2 speaker. You can pair it with other AirPlay 2s, and it is AirPlay 2. I think the last time we talked about it, we weren't exactly sure. But this is an AirPlay 2 speaker, and they actually have a video showing it on their funding page now. And there's no microphone in it. So privacy and security, you don't want to have any kind of other assistant in there like other speakers. This is the speaker for you. You can get one for $79 or three for $199. And because AirPlay 2, you can pair them all over your house. Andrew, are you excited as I am about these? I think these are cool. I love it. Like, I think they look really neat, and I am yeah. always about AirPlay speakers. I have so many in my home, and there's, like, we'll have, like, a cleaning day or something around here, and I will just turn them all on. So everywhere you walk, like, your music is, like, following around the house. It's awesome. So I love AirPlay speakers, and I love having a lot of them. So, yes, as ones that are especially, like, affordable like this, this is a great deal. Oh, my goodness. So AirPlay 2 speakers, you know, pair them. Multi-user access, you know, know, that's one of the things with, like, Bluetooth speakers like we talked about before. It's difficult to, like, switch who is playing from a Bluetooth speaker and all that. No, no, no. Use AirPlay 2. let alone multi-point audio, like, to send to multiple speakers at the same time. Yeah. This is the one to get. Go to doconnect.com slash HomeKit. Again, the pre-sales, the pre-orders are ending in just two weeks. So the special discount, get in there early, get in there now. doconnect.com slash HomeKit. And they're also giving off... 35% 35% off on future Dio nodes, additional speakers to everyone who pre-orders. Plus, they're also making a special edition speaker for those who pre-order, which is very cool. So, again, doconnect.com slash HomeKit. There will be a link in the show notes to that. And order some of these awesome AirPlay 2 speakers before time runs out. Our thanks to Dio for sponsoring this episode. So cool. I'm excited for this. It's not for more AirPlay should, 2 Should speakers. we just wait here a moment while everyone gets their pre-orders in? Like, yeah, we go ahead. We'll give, you, yeah, we'll give you a second. Dio no, I guess they can pause HomeKit. if they need to. Yeah, just... That is true. They can pause. Maybe we'll play some. I'll put some Jeopardy music in the uh, in the in the audio version yeah. of the show. That's yeah. fine. There you go. Click click the link. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Dio. All right, now you you had a, a special conversation with the people at the CSA, which is the Connectivity Standards Alliance, the group behind Matter, which can keep talking about the big promise of Matter. Colin, I believe it when I see it. And so you were able to get some additional answers on what they got going on. First of all, the categories of devices that will launch when Matter comes out. Tell me, what did you learn about that? Yeah, so this was super interesting. We've had 
kind of a lot of questions on the show and trying to get some answers. So, yeah, they were very nice to sit down with me, and we talked for, like, an hour. I talked to Chris LaPree, who is their um, the head of technology at the CSA, and then Michelle Mandala Freeman, who's the head of marketing and member services. And I got some actual tangible answers for some of the stuff that we have been hey. wondering on this show each week. And, by the way, one of them, I believe, not to, like, go back <laughs> before answering your question, but yeah. I believe with a Matter product, it will work if those third-party servers are shut down because it is a local protocol. So yes. the things that are, like, it's like borrowing something good from HomeKit and bringing it to Matter, something that, like, the Amazon smart homes are not using that are relying on those additional cloud servers won't be a thing with Matter. So things will still work if a company shuts down in the world of Matter, which is very nice to hear. Yes. Um, but getting to your actual question, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. device categories. So we had talked about these a little bit. I'm going to run through these real fast. So door locks are on the list, plugs and outlets, light bulbs, light switches, lighting controllers, thermostats, thermostats and HVAC controllers, blinds and shades, home kit or not home kit, home security sensors, motion contact, CO, smoke, garage door controllers, wireless access points and bridges and TVs and streaming video players. And the one that I didn't have originally on my list was control devices, which is interesting because that would encompass products like the, the Nest Hub Max or whatever it's called, um, but stuff like that. And that is specifically something that we've been wanting in HomeKit that you and I even have talked about a bunch. We want like, you know, an Apple smart display to control home devices. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, it seems like it's, it's messy and that as excited as I am for like a, a control device, like a smart display, I'm probably not going to jump on one because based on my understanding here from talking to them, matter controllers can only control matter devices. So mm -hmm. I can, I can absolutely see somebody saying I have HomeKit, all HomeKit devices. HomeKit works with matter. I'll buy a Matter controller, and it will control all of my HomeKit devices. That will not be the case. A Matter controller can only control Matter devices. So even though like HomeKit is part of Matter, I believe the devices would have to support Matter to mesh. So I think <laughs> yeah. a Google Nest Hub would theoretically only support your Matter HomeKit devices. I right. think. That was so my takeaway <laughs> from all of that and it gets super confusing um because yeah then you won't be able to use this to control non-matter devices so in like my house i'm sure there's gonna be a bunch of stuff updated like hue lights a lot of eve stuff things like that but then the random ones that aren't just won't show on a on a matter hub so i think that's going to be a little confusing and we just still need apple to release their own display controller so to be clear Let's say I have an Apple TV with HomeKit devices and I want to get the Nest Hub Max to control my smart home stuff. And I have a mix of HomeKit and Matter devices and all that. I get the Nest Hub Max thing. I pull up all my HomeKit or I pull up all my smart devices and basically devices that are HomeKit and support Matter will say like an Eve plug. I'll see the Eve plug in there. But yes. if I have, like, an older Wemo switch that's HomeKit but not Matter, that one won't be on the Nest Hub Max. Does that sound right? Correct. From my yeah. understanding, that's how it'll play out. Which, let's be honest, is not going to be a great experience for people. <laughs> like, it's not. Like, no. You're only going to see certain devices on certain controllers. That's not, that's not good. I don't, I don't think that is good. But... I mean, I, 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 you can't blame them for that because, like, that's a lot of stuff going on. And you can't expect yeah. them to, to communicate. But, yeah, that's a... Okay, that's unfortunate. Now, what about, like, we talked about certifications last time, whether or not a company is going to have to be certified with Matter and Apple and all that. Did we get any clarity on that interaction? Yeah, we did. This is something we talked about a lot. And our question specifically was how companies are able to say with certainty 
this product will work with matter at launch. And we were like, how can you say that when the standard isn't even certified? So if the standard isn't even isn't even finished yet, how can you guarantee that your product is going to support it and it's going to be certified for launch? And then our second question is, how are these certifications going to work and how much time are they going to take? And how do they expect to go faster than you know, Apple or other platforms that are getting certified. And we got answers, got some answers. So okay, okay. basically right now in testing, I think there's 136 some items that are in the, um, like the early programs, like from partner members that are helping develop the standard. So like these are the devices that they're actually using to create the standard. So because they're like participating in that, they will have a certification by the time that they're done. Because they're using these devices to actually create the standard, it'll be in full right. compliance and therefore will automatically be ready to go when matter is released. So that explains how many companies can promise that because they are likely one of those 136 items from 50 some companies okay. that are actually developing the standard. Does that? Okay track yeah 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 no, that makes sense okay so that's fine now one of the other yes. promises of matter is the casting to a tv uh aspect well hold on okay we're going to that real quick <clears throat> going back to the oh, testing the and break. certifications yes. mm -hmm. so that's how those 136 some items are going to be ready for day one okay once matter or the csa releases matter 1.0 they're going to be setting up these authorized test labs like across the globe. And there's going to be apparently a bunch of them done by several different um, like testing providers. And these labs will be where you can send your stuff to. So before you even send it, you can run through everything back at your offices, check for validity. Then you can send um, your stuff out and have it certified through one of these many testing labs. And then after that, it'll be like they'll um, they'll get like their certificate from the CSA. So okay. that's how that part is supposed to work. I still have questions on it. My biggest being of like how secure and thorough is this? I mean, we know like on the Amazon side, it's very weak. Most of them can like just do stuff like online and get like a certificate. Boom. And that's why you have so many security issues with devices that work on Amazon smartphone platform. And HomeKit, on the other hand, is the opposite, where you have to physically send that hardware in and every single device that works with it to Apple. And we've heard stories of it taking like years to get through that. So the CSA sounds like it's a middle ground. They're going to have yeah. a bunch of different labs, and they say it'll take a few weeks to run through this. So I don't know. We still don't know like how robust and secure that is compared to Apple's testing, but it seems like it's a much better than on the Amazon side, perhaps maybe not as robust on the as on the Apple side, but it's still a lot better than what people are experiencing today with those other competing platforms. So that makes a little bit more sense of how that's going to flow. Got it. And again, maybe you, you answered this, but if someone wants to also just be HomeKit certified, they'll have to get it approved by Apple also. That's a very good point. So right now I'm, I'm finishing work on a piece. When will it be published? I don't know. But um, I'm writing this something up on, on specifically how HomeKit and Matter are going to coexist, right. at least for the short term. And okay. the short answer is there's still going to be two standards, and you'll likely have to be certified in both if right. you want to take advantage of some of the additional HomeKit features. The Matter standard is not going to have certain fe features baked into it. And if you want to... Um, support them, you'll have to be certified through HomeKit. So it'll be a completely separate certification and you'll have to do both. HomeKit for everything there and then Matter for kind of a watered down version that'll work with your Amazon speakers, your Google speakers, stuff like that. Um, the gotcha. example that we talked about on the show is like uh, HomeKey or adaptive lighting. Like these features are still, are still specific to HomeKit. So in those cases, right. companies would still have to do both. So like Eve being one of the big ones that are HomeKit only, 
that's the route that I can see them going. <laughs> Still continuing to get their HomeKit certifications for products, but also being Matter certified. So it'll work with all those other platforms at the same time. But as we move forward in the Matter, there seems like there's always going to be the multiple platforms. You can just do a Matter certification and create a bare bones product that'll work everywhere but you'll still have to have independent certifications for each competing platform if you want to have platform-specific features. Mm, right. Okay, so now back to the casting. One of the promises of yeah. Matter is that there will be some kind of universal casting method so you don't have to think about AirPlay or Chromecast and all that stuff. It would just be Matter casting or whatever. What did you learn about that? Mm -hmm. I had a lot of questions about this. I'm like, okay, is this like an AirPlay or a Chromecast alternative? How is right. it going to work? What are your limitations with resolution, HDR, everything like that? Because we know Apple kind of makes a big deal with like recent versions of hardware where you can enable like 4K and HDR over AirPlay. And with Matter, it's going to work a little differently. So essentially, first you have to have two Matter enabled apps. So you need like an app running on your smart TV and then you need uh, matter running in whatever app you're casting from. So it doesn't oh. sound like it's going to be a system wide thing like airplay where you can, you know, mirror your screen up that won't right. work with matter because mm. what matter does is just send a URL to that TV. So if I'm okay. trying to play a video from my phone to my television, like I'm, I'm in Hulu or something and I'll, I'll hit the matter cast button and it shows up on the TV Basically, I, I'm just sending a URL to the television, and then the television is streaming that URL directly. So they say that the TV or that app will have to know what to do, what to play. So that's the that's the difference. It's pulling from that central database of content, um, and it's not the same hmm. as like the Chromecast or the AirPlay options. So I'm I'm going to be a little pessimistic about this standard, only because. Okay. <clears throat> From what I have experienced trying to get certain apps, even just to straight airplay, they can be very finicky. For example, I was actually helping someone set up MLB TV, an account, which, you know, getting games for the teams that you want to see is a whole, like, you know, black deal process. And I'm not going to go into details there. I don't want to get canceled. Uh, but trying to airplay using a VPN will say to a TV like multiple times. The app was like, Oh, you can't screen record. So no, like, sorry, this won't airplay. And then like, sometimes it would take quitting the app, starting it. Eventually we just hooked it up with an HDMI cable and a lightning adapter. And that worked. <laughs> so I'm curious now knowing that every app also has to support another standard, which is just like that XKCD comic. Everyone just has to support another AirPlay type standard. I don't know. I feel like that's not going to be as fast of an adoption as even AirPlay since they already do that. I don't know. Does that make sense? It does. But I mean, there's still some apps that don't support AirPlay and there's still yeah. TVs and media players that don't support AirPlay. Again, it's being able to create that one solution that'll work across the board, right? So right. all an app has to do is support AirPlay and boot or support Matter, and no matter their device yeah. they're using, Android, iOS, no matter what TV you know, the more or less they're using, they can yeah. accept that that URL and determine what right. to play. So it makes sense, but whether or not it's like better, right? It'll just depend. For a lot of people that already have like AirPlay stuff, it's not going to make a huge deal. But that's kind of the thing with my big takeaway is like while Matter is a lot of like uh, a lot of good stuff for version 1.0, it's not going to mean a ton for HomeKit users. Right. We're not really getting any new device categories. We're not getting any new um, you know features really. Right. We're getting we'll be able to use more devices. But they're in the not category, even going to be yeah. necessarily as good as existing HomeKit devices. So maybe cheaper options right. will become available to us, but we're not going to see what we want. I think in Matter for another couple years. Like they're not talking right. about version two of Matter yet because one isn't even out. But it's in those future updates where we're going to have appliances, where we're going to have like, heck, oh, I want my you know Siri control toaster oven. Not happening in 1.0, maybe 2.0. Same thing with the stuff that I've been wanting, which is robo vacuums and um, what's the other one? Pet beaters. 
right. aren't in, you know, version one of the spec. So we're going to have to wait for things like that. So 1.0 yeah. doesn't matter. It needs to get here. You have to start somewhere, but <laughs> right. there's not a lot for HomeKit users in this initial launch. Okay. Well, and finally, did you get any kind of update or confirmation of timeline? Are we still looking at fall 2022 this fall? Yeah, absolutely. Everything seems on track. The, okay. They gave me more insight into why it was delayed. So basically, there, there's, I mean, there's a couple different reasons. So originally, we were trying to plan for like five or six different platforms. You know, the big ones like iOS and um, Amazon, uh, Android, things like that. Yeah. And then things quickly escalated. Where <laughs> Will Ferrell had, meme that escalated yeah, they quickly. Had so much like interest that it ended up with, I think they told me they are now supporting 16 different platforms for launch, which is nuts. Okay. And they um, they also were adding in um, an additional like testing event um, where people could come and participate and test all their products, inter- interoperability, everything like that, to as they made more changes and refinements to the code. So basically just added in one extra testing event and then the additional launch platforms ended up pushing them back a little bit. And I said this okay. before, it wasn't a huge delay. You said this too. Like we were going from summer or mid 2022 to fall. Like mid to fall is not a, a big jump, maybe a couple months at best. So from all accounts, like they just finished their eighth testing event. Everything went great. So okay. there's not anything this particularly delaying at this point other than just making sure they're crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's and getting this thing rolled out. They could do an Apple coming this fall and literally release it the day before spring starts like December or whatever, (laughs) 12th or something. But yeah, that's fine. Hey, 2022, if it comes out this year, I'll be, I will have seen it and then I will believe it. (laughs) I I mean, I'm still hoping I'm more honestly hoping at this point we hear more from Apple at dub dub. I mean, yes. That was official now. Hopefully we actually hear some changes coming to HomeKit or their their formal process for, you know, matter accessories and everything and how those are going to work because you still will have to have some different stuff in there. I mean, exactly. for, um, you know, that list of accessories, it specifically has, where are the blinds and shades? Um, you know, I, I would count like blinds as you're like, you know, similar to a vertical curtain, like your slat blinds and stuff like that. Right. So, okay. Is that going to be a different device type in HomeKit? Are they going to have a horizontal slider instead of a vertical one? Hmm. Apple will still have to make additions and changes to the home app to support these things or, you know, new iconography for device controllers and stuff. So it'll yes. be interesting at what Apple is going to announce or just going to show up in iOS 16 by the time this launches. Gotcha. Okay, well, good update. Thank you for that. Stay tuned, everyone, as we continue to cover matter. Got another house date for you, or house date. What? <laughs> Forgot to say up. Got another house update for you, and the Angel's got some devices that he's been uh, playing with, so we're going to talk about those. But we want to thank our second and final sponsor for today, which is Collide. That's Collide with a K, K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash HomeKit. Listen, Collide sends employees of your company important, timely, and relevant security recommendations For their device, whether it's a Linux, Mac, Windows device, right inside of Slack. So what I love about this is imagine you're like running the IT at your company or you're over that department and you have people saving their like temporary passwords or one-time passcodes in a text file on their desktop because they don't know where to save it. Well, that's not very secure. Now, you could try and lock down that device using, like, mobile device management and make it so they can't save any file anywhere, and then that's going to be really frustrating, and your employees are not going to feel like they actually have use of their devices. Or you can work with Collide, and what Collide does, it will automatically look for security red flags like that, like, oh, they just saved passwords on their desktop. They shouldn't do that. And that employee will get a Slack private message right inside Slack and tell them, hey, saw you save this to your desktop, maybe don't do that. Let's find another place to save it. And it'll make those kinds of security recommendations automatically and ongoing so you can empower your employees to take security and privacy into their own hands. This is so cool. You can visit collide.com slash HomeKit. You sign up today, and you, there's actually a Collide gift bundle for free. After you try, do a trial activation, you can just do the trial and get the free gift bundle. There's like T-shirts and stuff. So anyway, I, I think this sounds super cool. Andrew, what do you think about this? 
I think you're going to be showing up wearing the fly t-shirt <laughs> next week's episode. <laughs> Listen, I, um, I would... Anyway, no, yeah. I love it. Anything that's going to bridge the gap of like making IT work easier, increasing security, and allowing users to be more free in what they do, I think that is an absolute win across the board. Absolutely. And, and I have worked with mobile device management, and it is good, and you need it for certain things, but a lot of times people just do things like... Path of least resistance. People are going to save passwords in a text file on their desktop. People can do other things. Some other stuff that, that Collide can help with. It can instruct developers to set passphrases on unencrypted SSH keys. It can help convince employees to uninstall evil, evil browser extensions. If your employees are always running into like, well, I don't know what my web browser is doing. It goes to yahoo.com by default every time I open it. Well, that means you downloaded something you shouldn't have downloaded. Collide will help with all of that. That's just some of the use cases that Collide can help with. So you can try Collide and all of its features on an unlimited number of devices for free for 14 days. No credit card required. Try it totally for free, 14 days. Try it out at collide.com slash homekit, K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash homekit today. Our thanks to Collide for sponsoring this episode. They got me excited. Thank you, Collide, for sponsoring this episode. I wanted to say that clearly. That was, I get that. Man. Come and come work done. Send you a T-shirt, Stephen. Listen, Collide. You send me a T-shirt. I will. We will wear it on the show. I will wear it right here, right there. All right. A uh, real quick, just just a quick house update. Uh, I actually had Frontier Internet come out yesterday, and finally got good word. They're like, no problem. We're going to install gig service. We're going to run the cable to the closet that you planned all your Ethernet to come to. Sigh of relief. I'm going to have good internet in the room that I needed it. So very excited for that. That'll be installed in about a week or so. Huge weight lifted. I, I thought I was going to have to be doing uh, like satellite internet and I don't want to be doing that. So anyway, huge win there. Also, um, I was in Best Buy the other day looking for TV mounts because I was installed. I wanted to get the mounts up on the wall early. And I saw a Sonos Arc, Andrew, an open box white Sonos Arc, which is what I was wanting to get for the living room. And I was able to save like 50 bucks. I was able to open the box. They let me look at it all, pristine condition. And so they were like shipping. It was going to take a week or two to get one ordered from Sonos or Best Buy or whatever. And I saw one in the store. So, you know, pays to maybe visit some stores sometimes and maybe get a deal. Got an open box deal. So that was pretty cool. I was excited for that. Um, I'm, I'm debating on setting it up. We're going to be, we're like three weeks away from moving, three to four weeks away. I have the Sonic Arc like just sitting here and I really wanted to try it out. But I'm like, I'm going to have to do this whole setup process and connect it to this Wi-Fi network and can have a Sonos house. And then I don't know if it's going to be as easy to move it. What do you think, Andrew? Should I take it out and try it or just wait till I get in the new house? Oh, man, that's difficult because I am an impatient child and I want to <laughs> play with things immediately. Um, but also, yeah. like, I, I don't know if you're going to have, like, a new Wi-Fi network name. It will to, be. Like, erase and reset everything. Like that yeah. sounds like it's probably more, I don't know. You should probably wait. Like if I'm going to be the responsible mm. one and tell you mm. what to do, I would say it would be easier just to wait, <laughs> stare at it, box, Well, let's see. So listeners and viewers, comment what you think I will do, and I will update you on the next episode, whether or not it stayed in. Because you know what number episode is next, Andrew? Do you know what's coming? I know. It's crazy. My good episode 100, Andrew. We made it to 100 episodes of Home Kid Insider. What? Anyway, everyone sorry, said we'd never there. make it past three. All of the naysayers. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I have to be honest. Again, listeners, thank you for being awesome and viewers on YouTube because I've heard from other like podcast networks and people like smart home shows are difficult, and even ones that. Try to cover all smart home is even harder because it's kind of like this neb like it's weird and you know your audience if they're invested in one platform they're half the show is going to be something that doesn't affect them and so I think specializing in HomeKit has helped but just thank you listeners and viewers because yeah a hundred episodes and the show is like successful like you guys are awesome thank you for that so anyway just want to say that. I know we have like I'm always shocked like when we go in and look at. Um, the 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 metrics and stuff for this show i'm always surprised like for such a niche show yes. there is a surprisingly good audience out there like yes i didn't know how because we struggle 
on uh, the video side, like on Apple Insider's YouTube channel, doing some home kit stuff, it, mm. a lot of times there's just no audience for it. And I, I can't, I can't pay people to watch some of those home kit videos. <laughs> and uh, I hear similar uh, complaints on the website that there's just not a ton of interest on the smart home stuff. So I think when we set out to do this, that there was a lot of like, this is even going to make sense. Like who's going to really listen to this? And then you guys proved us like that there was like a point to doing this. Yes. There's a lot of people who watch this show, which is yes. awesome. Or listen it to is this awesome. show. Some yeah, watch both. the show. Some watch it. Some, <laughs> it is awesome. So yes, <laughs> thank you all. And uh, finally, I just want to mention, uh, this is a, a picture of the home theater setup that's going to be in our living room. And I installed the other day in-wall speakers, Andrew, all by myself. Those rectangles are in-wall speakers. They're Polk Audio. And I just have to say, I had never done that before. I leveled and measured 18 times. I got one of those laser levels. They're like shoots of, you know, perfectly level laser on the wall to make sure everything was lined up. And one of the scariest things I have ever done, Andrew, was to take a drywall saw and jab my brand new wall and start cutting away at the wall. <laughs> and it was terrifying. It was a terrifying experience. I was so scared I was going to screw it up and there would just be a massive hole in the wall. But it all worked out great. I put the speakers in. The cables were right where we left them before the drywall went up, which was another like, I hope this cable hasn't like slid down somewhere or dropped. And it all worked out great. I got in-wall speakers now. And so I got two in-walls, four in the ceiling. I'm going to have a center speaker on whatever cabinet we put there. I'm going to have a full-on 7.1 Dolby Atmos theater. So I'm very excited for that. Just wanted to share that with you. I love Terrifying. that that was the scariest part. Was Listen, I mean, yourself. it's like brand new house, brand new drywall. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> terrible. I feel you, man. Like, here in the studio, um, I'm afraid, like, for me, it's like a little bit of the opposite. I'm afraid for the smallest things. I'm afraid to put a nail in the wall. To have, like, my walls are white because I'm afraid to touch them with anything because yeah. I don't, I don't. Now they're my walls versus, like, in an apartment right. where I will put 30 nails and it is fine. But here I yes. am terrified of touching the clean new walls. But I have no problem cutting them open because... I can, I, I mean, I can patch a small hole, but I can, I feel like the big ones are like easier because like, I clearly have to patch that and make it, like get the paint a whole area, like a little dot, I'm like, oh my gosh, what the paint doesn't match on this tiny little spot or if you can that see a true. bump, like it's a whole thing. And I panic more about a tiny little pinhole than I would be out cutting a one by one square out of the wall. But okay, I feel you. Well, I'm afraid to yeah, hang yeah. things up. Yeah. Yeah. I am too. Yeah. I level, um. I'm mostly do about the leveling too, but anyway, okay. So that's my home update. We'll let you, we'll keep you guys updated on all of that. Had a bunch of three way switch nonsense going on. We'll get back to that someday. But anyway, you had uh, some cool devices. I wanted to talk about a Nomad charger. You actually did a review of that, a new MagSafe charger. Tell me about it. What you got there? This guy here for Ooh. video folk is the Nomad Base One Max. So Fancy. this is the company's second official MagSafe charger. They actually have a second one, which is just the base one. Yes. This is the base one, Steven, which is just a single um, MagSafe puck. And then right. they have the base one Max, which is the big guy that has the MagSafe puck alongside an Apple Watch puck. Cool. So cool. it's pretty sweet in that regard. A couple things I learned as I was like getting into the nitty gritty details about this stuff. So the single puck Charges at 15 watts, but it requires a 30 watt power adapter. 30 watts. The right. double one that also charges an Apple Watch also only needs a 30 watt power adapter. Apple's mm. single charger only needs a 20 watt. And I learned that Apple has, like, kind of digging through some um, specification stuff, like, they have to really ensure that you're getting, like, clean power to this to maintain like consistent speeds so that's why you see like mophi nomad belkin all using like 30 watt chargers because they have to like convert into a clean amount of wattage for the charger and when you have like the apple watch on there 
you still have enough headroom because it doesn't need right. a 30 watts that speed. It just needs to make sure you can get a clean amount of power out. So that's why you can use a 30 watt charger on both of them. The hmm. base one max is not much more. I don't remember the prices on these. Maybe you can do your Google magic while I one fifty uh, ramble it's 150 for, a for the max. Yeah. And how much is it for the single one? Oh, okay. I'll Google that. <laughs> Hold okay. On. Yeah. But my point is like the single one is expensive. And when you tack on that Apple Watch charger, I'm like, eh, it's not so bad now. I mean, it's still expensive, but I feel better at 150 for two rather than uh 130. Um, is that right? Yeah, yes, it's 130 dollars. So it's a, only it's like a 20 dollar difference, and you get the Apple Watch charger. If you don't have an Apple Watch, sure, it doesn't make sense. But for 20 dollars more, get the one with the watch charger. Yeah. Just, also, it looks like. Correct me if I'm wrong. This does not fast charge the Apple Watch. Correct. They started dev, yeah. um, I believe, beforehand. And I also don't think Apple's really... Apple's still limiting who can get those modules. I've talked to a bunch of different manufacturers who are like, I would love to build an Apple Watch fast charger, but Apple's restricting who can get them and stuff like that. So like, I've gotten a bunch of like MagSafe style chargers and even ones that are like going through like this, they still just don't have um, the fast charge modules yet. Apple mm. is just not really uh, releasing them. So like, there's only like a couple. There's what? The new Apple, the new, uh, sorry, Belkin right. 2. The three that's the one. only third-party fast charge ones that are out there. Which that's the one I have, the Belkin 3-in-1 Boost Charge mm -hmm. Pro, which has got the three charging areas, phone, AirPods, and watch, and it fast charges the watch. It also costs the same amount, $150, as the Nomad Pro. So... I know, but it's largely like it's. It, I, I don't like the ones that are all the way flat like that. Like, who's got that much space on like their counter, their desk? I like the takes a lot of space. They give a little more uh, height, too. but Belkin's three-in-one uh, tree-style one doesn't have the fast charge puck. Correct. So. And once I once I went fast charge, you don't go back. I really like the fast charging, so that's kind of my prerequisite prerequisite now. But anyway, I know. And also, and that watch thing. Broken. Yeah, that watch thing doesn't fold down either, right? Like it's permanently up yes, on the it's, Nomad? Yes, it's metal, it's, it's okay. fixed in that position, which I prefer because you have more options for bands. Like if it's flat and you have like a Melanese loop like I do, you can't put it on there um, right. if it was flat. So when it's propped up, you can use any bands that you want. But it was, this like would not be good for easier. like traveling because it doesn't fold up. It weighs like... like over two pounds. This is not a oh. travel charger. <laughs> right, right, right. Because if you sit it on your desk charger. Right. It looks, I mean, it looks really nice, high quality and all that for sure. But, um, okay, that's interesting. Well, we'll put a link to that in show notes. I'll put a link to my Belkin 3 and 1 too because I really like the Belkin 1. But anyway, uh, last thing too, real quick. This is not home related at all. Andrew's now looking for it. I'm going to yeah. fill time as I <laughs> as Andrew leaves to look for it. But Andrew got to do a review of the new device, I believe this is from Panic, the developers of apps like Transfer. He got a play date. What? What are you shaking your head at? Transmit. What did I say? Transfer? Transfer. <laughs> Transmit. I meant to say transmit. Andrew got a play date, and he's holding it right now. Tell us about the play yeah, date. It's freaking adorable. This thing cool. is so cool. I love it a whole lot. They're just now shipping the first batch of these things, but it's a super retro gaming console. It's like a mix of all the retro stuff. It's like this one bit display, um, tiny form factor, stuff like that. But it's also so modern because it has things like USB-C, Wi-Fi and all of that. And when you buy one, you get access to a full season of games, which they double from their initial promise. So you get 24 games. Wow. This. And like That's every cool. Friday it'll pop up. You can see like, on my screen, Steven, that yes. little badge in the corner. It's like new games available. And then they have so many animations. Like, look at the screen. You have to like press the button twice to wake it up. It's so That's cool. So cool. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so if I find a new game here, like this is just the little stuff that I love. Okay. Gotta pull it up to the camera again for Steven to see. So you got a new game that's like ready to be used. And I hit the A button. And little robot arms come out and unwrap it. So wow. it's like, boom, you have a new game. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. It's That's cool. a lot of fun. That is Hyper Meteor. Um, <laughs> some of those 24 <laughs> games are going to be really quick and short. Other ones are going to be uh, longer and more replayability and stuff. There's just a huge variety in the games that are included. 
the crank is really fun. Like some games don't use it, other ones do use it. There's one game that I like that's huh. called Casual Birder, and I, I think the premise is really funny. I'm probably like, the only one who thinks it's hilarious. But you like walk into town, like for the first time, and a group of kids walks up to you. Huh, what do you think you are? Some sort of casual birder? And like that's such a, a terrible insult, and I think it's hilarious. So you go around town trying to capture pictures of birds, and it's like almost like Pokemon trying to like collect them all, and you use the crank to focus your camera. So when you see like a bird nearby, you'll go into your camera mode, and then you'll use the crank to change the focus on your camera to get a picture of the bird. So there's wow. ones like that that use it, other ones that don't. But it, it's a really neat little console. You can also sideload games. Like they make it really easy to to add any games that you want. You can do like over Wi-Fi or plugging it into your computer and sideloading them. <laughs> so companies are releasing additional paid games that you can buy and put onto your Playdate. They also make it really easy to develop your own games. There's like this pulp in browser game creator where you can like design your own like lo-fi music and your own fonts, all sorts of fun stuff. Wow. Uh, or full on uh, SDK that you can load into like any uh, development tools that you want, like their own Nova platform, and develop games for Playdate. It's awesome. This thing is really cool, cool. So I'm excited that other people are actually <laughs> getting to try it out. That is that is really fun. And so you got a review on Apple Insider, right? We can link to that. Sure do. Complete with a video. I was yes. so excited that I did a video on it. That is very cool. Very cool. Well, there'll be a link in show notes to that review. And, of course, everything we talked about on today's episode. And, hey, uh, shoot us some 100-episode messages this week before we record. We record pretty soon after the last episode airs. So tweet at us quickly because we would love to uh, maybe read some some tweets uh, on air for a 100 episode. That'd be fun. Honestly, I feel like it's a really big milestone, and I have in no way any ideas on how to make it a big episode. So... Yeah, tell, tell us. Give us ideas, and then we'll have, like, one day to prepare. I don't even have, like, any fun news to talk about. Like, no, no, well, if we had news, we would have shared it in this episode. But, like, I don't even have yeah. any, like, embargo news that's going to be fun to chat about by the next one. Like, we're going to have nothing maybe, in this episode. Our 100 episodes going to be boring. Maybe you should put glitter in your beard. Uh, no. <laughs> anyway, well, tweet at us. Let us know. Links to everything in the show notes are thanks to Dio Connect and Collide. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can watch us, youtube.com slash HomeKit Insider as well. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.